so uh, I want to welcome everybody here uh, today, and um, you know, we've had the pleasure of spending the last uh, 24 hours or so with uh, Mr. Glassman, some of the crew from CrossFit, talking about um, chronic conditions and the CrossFit methodology and philosophy and, and the uh, potential for curing those chronic conditions. And, you know, I know a lot of uh, our staff and a lot of our tribal members and, and fellow CrossFitters and Wellness Center members and whatnot are here. Um, this is going to be a really good talk about, about curing chronic conditions. And, um, you know, it's, it's the underlying reason why we do what we do through our wellness centers and uh, why our tribe and our, leader, our tribal leadership supports what we do so much. So um, I know you guys didn't come to listen to me, so without further ado, Mr. Greg Glassman. Thank you. I'm Mike. Just like that. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having us here. It's really, a, really an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm going to share something with you because my mom said I wouldn't share it with you, and I told her I would, and I've been sharing it. But I'm going to keep sharing it so I can get mom points. Um, my mom lives in Choctaw, Alabama. She was born and raised there. When she retired, she went back there, and uh, my mom's. Uh, Daddy, my grandpa, his mother was a Choctaw Indian, and uh, she's, she's a believer, she's a supporter, and so she was really proud that I was coming here. She's been supporting the schools for years, and uh, so thank you from my mom. Um, now this shifts into kind of an uncomfortable talk. We're going to talk about dying. hate to do that, but uh, no, you're a, you're a hero here. I've been saying good things about you all day. You get, to, you get to have your phone go off. If you forgive me, when mine does. I'm going to put five buckets up here, and I'm going to call this one chronic disease. And I'm going to put some smaller buckets. This one I'm going to call kinetic. And this one I'm going to call genetic. And this one I'm going to call microbic. And this one I'm going to call toxic, although I picked toxic because they all went ick, and I like that. But technically, this should be poison, of which toxic is, is a specific type. So if we got any super thinkers out there, I'm just covering my butt. But I got five buckets here, and a little game I want to play, and then I'll explain these divisions, and then I'm going to give you some, some I think, life-saving information. But what I'd like to do is play a little game here, and I'd like you to just kind of throw some you to throw at me some horrible things that can happen to you that would kill your butt. All right? We'll start with you. Heart attack. Heart attack. I'll put that right here. You. Yeah. Cancer. I'm going to put it in here with a little bit of caution because not all cancer goes in there. Um, there are some cancers that, that would go in here. There are some cancers that, uh, that could go in here, and there's some cancers that go in here. But it's not the bulk of them. And uh, about many of those, like this one, there's not much you can do. You understand if you get bad parents, it's hard to fix it, the genetic thing, right? You pick the wrong folks, okay? Um, so in, in, the, in the sense of anything we can do something about, this is going to go here right here for sure. And I'll just spill the beans for you, it's uh, epithelial can uh, cancers related to uh, endometrial dysregulation um, or epithelial dy dysregulation. So give me another method, unfortunate circumstance. Diabetes. Diabetes, yeah, we're loading this bucket. Give me another one, somebody else, just yell it out. Car crash, Car crash. I love it, it's kinetic. Give me another one. What is it? What did, he, what did he say? Oh, yeah, um, that won't kill you. You wish it would, but it wouldn't. Right, Shaka? That's not, that's not, that's kind of eternal, but it, but it is a chronic condition. <coughs> Alzheimer's, right here. <laughs> Suppose that, that we're, like, you know, someone uh, held you down and gave you something. 
goes right in here, toxic, poisoned. How about if you did it to yourself on the regular as a bad habit? Cigarettes, Cigarettes go right in here. If I hold you down and shoot you up with heroin, I poisoned you. If you do it to yourself, it's chronic disease. Okay? Name some others. Let's, let's do this. AIDS. Microbic. Genetic. Cystic fibrosis, right? Just bad, bad luck. I've played this game for 30 minutes at a medical school with its staff. And almost everything that comes my way is either chronic disease or it's kinetic, and that just means like physical. Shot, stabbed, dropped, cut in half, crashed. Genetic, bad genes, right? Microbic uh, uh, virus, uh, bacteria, uh, fungus, uh, prion, and in toxic, you've been poisoned, okay? Now, I wanna, you see there's a big bucket, you notice that big bucket's a big bucket? You see that? This big bucket, according to CDC, accounts for about 70% of deaths, according to Gallup, by uh, means probably more trusted, 88% of deaths. This is somewhere between 30% of deaths and some, maybe as low as 12. That's a CDC number, there's a Gallup number. The CDC is using older numbers because it makes it look like they're doing a better job at what they do. Um, but the expense is pretty much agreed on. This is 86% of medical expense. 86% is going into chronic diseases. And so what I want to do now is I want to give you some sense. So, I mean, this, this, is, this is a big chunk, right? 70, 88% of why people die and 86% of our medical expenditure. These things are by and large accidents. I think you understand that car accident is, is largely accidents. Those poor people in Vegas that were, that were murdered, that was, that, was, that was, you know, accident. It wasn't something of their own, I mean, accident, not of their own control so much, right? You got bad parents, did you screw up? Nope. Um, you, got, you, got, you got a bug, you know, what are you gonna do, wear a mask? You see, watch the people, you've seen those people wearing masks <laughs> everywhere. Do you always wonder about them? I, like, I wonder if they're contagious or they're afraid I am. But I, but I had a client that wore masks like that all the time, and his thing was he didn't want to catch what anyone else had. But he was sick five times more than I ever was. I don't, I don't know what it was behind him. And, uh, and uh, poisoned. I, these, you know, I, I, there's not a lot of preventive opportunity here. We can sit here tonight, and what are we going to make sure we never get poisoned? I don't know, you know, you, child-proof cabinets. I mean, what do you do? Child-proof caps. Uh, don't drink out of unmarked bottles. I, it's, but um, these things are largely accidents, and these are not. But forget all of this. What I'm going to do now is I just want to go through, and I want to tell you, because, look, if this is killing as much as 88% of the people, and certainly no less than 70, if we could, if we could do something here, you'd want to do it, no? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you what you can do. It's, this is really easy. First thing I'm going to tell you is that all of this, the problem and the solution, are actually very simple. Very simple, and here's why I say that. It has two root causes, and it's sedentarism, kind of a fancy word for sitting on the couch watching TV, being sedentary, like we're all doing right now. But, but 20 hours a day of this, or 24 hours a day of this isn't good, okay? And the second cause, so it's got two causes. The second one is excess Carbohydrate, CHO is an abbreviation for carbohydrate. They're made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Too much carbohydrate. And what's carbohydrate? Well, it's broccoli, but that's, it's hard to get an excess of carbohydrate eating broccoli. The carbohydrate that we're talking about, the easy way to get excess in carbohydrate is sugars and starches. But we're going to make public enemy number one sugar. Because for most of us here, the most of the suffering that we see, I think, would be avoided if we just eliminated the sugar. But we can start backing off on all carbohydrates. We eliminate the sugars. And if you, if you find perfect health, you let it go. If you're still not there, you got a little extra weight, there's some blood lipids that aren't right, then what we start is removing the starches. Less potato, less rice. But we want to start with, with the uh, flat bread with the honey on it, right? <laughs> no, it's not flat bread. Uh, uh, fried bread. Fried bread with the, with the honey and uh, how was the recipe? Yeah. 
Yum. So, so it's simple because these are the two factors. And what we say is you want to get off the couch and off the carbs. And that is simple, but I, I got to admit this, because I'm sitting here telling this is really simple, but it's also really hard. It's simple as opposed to complex. Simple and complex are opposites. Hard and easy are, are opposites. But something can be simple and hard. And the reason it's simple is because there's only two elements. It's sedentarism and carbohydrate. And the reason it's hard because it's getting off the couch and not eating sugar. <laughs> and that's hard to do. And, and I just, I'm going to be honest with you, there's nobody out there anywhere. There are people that have, hadn't had any sugar in a forever, and they haven't sat still in years. And they still, part of them do that because they're worried about sugar and they're worried about holding still. Because even the people that are the most active and have the most willpower recognize that you can succumb to this in a heartbeat. I told the example earlier today of my Nicole Carroll, who has been, she's our, our director of training. She has been a CrossFit uh, superstar for 15 years now. Um, she's just, a, just, she's probably one of the top five trainers to, to walk the earth today, in my opinion. Just an amazing, amazing human being. On the subject of sedentarism, and this, she does not miss workouts, does not miss workouts. Um, she said she worries about missing a workout because she's afraid if she does, she'll miss another one, a second one, a third one, and won't work out. She fears sedentarism, and it couldn't be further from her life. And the article that we wrote on her about her experiences with proper nutrition, the title of the article, and she picked it, was Getting Off the Crack. So that tells you something about her sense of, of vulnerability, so, someone who is far removed from holding still, far removed from eating too much carbohydrate, still recognizes the trap. And so if it's true for her, it's triple true for me and triply true beyond me for some others. So this is a simple problem in, 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 in that there are very few parts, but it's complicated maybe, um, or, or it's, it's, it's hard rather in doing it. And there are some complications. The complications come in describing <coughs> what happens when you're sedentary and you have excess carbohydrate, I have to talk to you about glycation, about oxidative stress, about, about uh, inflammation. And then you will well, tell me about inflammation. All of a sudden, we're talking about icosanoids and prostaglandins. And it gets very, very complicated. But all that goes away if you get off the couch and get off the carbs. And so it doesn't need to be complicated unless you have to understand exactly how it is that you're killing yourself <laughs> beyond not doing it. Okay, So simple. Second piece here, and this makes perfect sense and follows. They are self-inflicted. Now, if you're following along so far, I don't think you can deny self-inflicted if you will accept that, that the theory here is that it's, it's caused by sedentarism, that is, sitting on the couch and eating too much carbs, and, and that's the simple truth of it. Well, then, what would happen if you didn't do that? It wouldn't be there, right? These are willful behaviors. You understand that? that that it, it, it's not that it takes the decision to get off the couch, but you have to understand there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a willful act to get on the couch and stay there. And, and it's not that during the commercial, the, the, the cake came out of the fridge and began your lap. You got it and went and got it during the commercial. So these are willful acts, and if you don't do these willful acts, you won't have this simple condition. And so it's simple and it's self-inflicted. If you can accept that, I think you'd have to see then it would be preventable. And how is it preventable? By not self-inflicting. <laughs> get off the couch, get off the carbs. Then it's preventable. You're not self-inflicting this, this misery on yourself. Four, curable. Now, curable. Curable doesn't mean get better. Curable means eliminate the root cause. But I'm going to tell you that it's not just curable, it's largely reversible. Largely. Can you get so sick and so damaged through chronic disease that you're not going to get better? Absolutely, many have. The casino is full of them. But listen, if you had a chronic condition, wouldn't it be better to not have it get worse even if you couldn't make it better? And if you could make it just a little bit better, isn't that a lot better than making it worse? And what if you could make almost all of it go away? I'll tell you what we've seen with chronic disease. We're always amazed at how much of it can be reversed, even when there's parts that can't. 
You can do permanent. Look, you can kill yourself with this. Of course you can do permanent damage. But at any point, the first time you eat one meal that isn't, that isn't loaded with sugars and you do some exercise where you haven't the day before, you've removed the root cause of your disease at that very instant. And the root cause doesn't reassert itself until you have that first bad meal again and will yourself back to the couch. Don't work out. So curable and to large extent reversible. Number five, deadly. I don't think that needs a lot of explaining. Somewhere between 70 to 88 percent of the population, and by the way, this is holding true globally. It's become an asymptotic figure for developing nations, for third world countries. And in indigenous um, populations, uh, American Indian, uh, Inuit, uh, uh, the uh, Maori, uh, uh, the uh, original settlers, we'll call them now, I think of Australia, um, the, the incidence in, in the costs are always greater, always greater. Deadly, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, as deadly, nothing. Number six, costly. You want to bankrupt the tribal economy? We do it with disease. Unbelievable cost. 86% of current medical expenditure. There's no portion of the economy growing faster than the expenses around chronic disease. And it's more true in your community and in the Mexican-American population, the black population, than it, than it is anywhere else. And this is the last piece, number seven. I want to talk about addiction because it's not lost on me. Let me tell you how I arrived at this kind of understanding. I'm sitting there one day and I'm thinking, okay, I get it. You're sitting on the couch and you're eating jelly donuts and you're watching Friends until you get diabetes and you're an unfortunate victim of disease. But if I sit on the couch and I shoot heroin and watch a different channel, I'm some kind of degenerate. And I was like, I, how's that different again? They're willful behaviors. They're chronic recurring willful behaviors that contribute to your final demise. So I was like, I, I'm not getting the difference again. I gotta, I gotta look this up. So I put chronic disease and addiction into Google. And the first thing that came back was from the National Institute of Health and it was an infographic that was entitled Addiction is Chronic Disease. There. Um, these are willful destructive habits. I'm not saying if you sit on the couch and eat a donut, you're going to die. I'm saying if you do it every single day, you spend six hours a day doing it, you're going to die. You're going to have a short and brutish life. I turned then and looked at these two things, sedentarism and carbohydrate, excess carbohydrate. What is the addictive nature of that? I mentioned it earlier. My Nicole Carroll says she's afraid of missing a workout because she's afraid she'll miss a second one. She's afraid she'll miss a third. She's afraid she won't work out for a month or maybe never again. I put sedentarism into Google and with the word addiction, when I get pay dirt, there have been many scholars that have suggested that sedentarism is a recurring, self-reinforcing, destructive, unhealthy behavior. We looked at the carbohydrate. Anyone here ever had any inkling of the notion that sugar was addictive? This is Karen Thompson right here. She's written a book on sugar and addiction. If it's not addictive, then we need to re-examine what addiction means. Anyone got kids here? <laughs> I got a bunch of them. I got, <laughs> I, I tell, I said, because I named one of my kids, I said, there's no lie she won't tell for a piece of candy. <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean, it's, it's just, it's crazy. The behaviors are nuts. It's tough, but simple. Chronic disease, it's simple. It's self-inflicted. It's preventable. It's reversible, curable, deadly, costly. It's an addiction. 
And we're here to tell you that, 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 the, that, the, that uh, uh, Chance Adams and the wellness program here has an answer. They are, they are, as we speak, day in, day out, in the business of reversing and preventing chronic disease. Reversing is great, because someone comes in the door maybe obviously damaged, and then later we all see this over time they get better. It's hard to see the prevention. We, you don't see the Alzheimer's that won't happen, the stroke that won't happen, the cancers that won't happen, the heart attack that won't happen, but it, it is a fact nonetheless. Otherwise, you, you, you don't believe in preventative efforts, and that would be kind of like being crazy, wouldn't it? To think that, you know, checking your tires wouldn't preserve the, you know, I mean, these, these kind of basic stuff. CrossFit is here, and I don't mean me. I mean Chance and the seven CrossFit centers in your 14, in your 14 wellness centers is here reversing chronic disease. We've come to support that effort to give encouragement, to give uh, uh, support, recognition, and to talk to you about that, to let you know that I, I, don't, think you want it, I don't think you want any of these. You know, we ask the public, what don't you want to get? It's cancer and heart disease. The public's really afraid of cancer, most of all. Um, heart disease, second. And then it's all kinds of competing things that the public fears. When you ask physicians, what they don't want is diabetes, is almost every time. Right on top. I don't want diabetes. It's, it's a horrible way to die. It's a horrible way to live. And we all have, we can all do something about this. You know, I had in other talks, I'd said that after looking at all this, I go, it's your fault. And I know that doesn't sound good, though. No one likes me. What do you mean my fault? You know, because maybe not. Maybe your doctor told you wrong. Maybe you read wrong. But, but what I'm trying to do is, is suggest something that's very, very empowering. Because if it's your fault, only you can fix it. And the truth is, whether you see this as your fault or not, only you can do this. Chance and I can encourage you to get off the couch. We can invite you off the couch. We can have you into the gym and make sure you don't get on the couch when you're in the gym. But at the end of the day, it will be a willful decision of yours to not be sedentary. And as that donut's gone, you go, no, that, see, that, you got to do that if you can. Or maybe it's best not to touch it, huh? <laughs> but it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a willful behavior on your part. Nothing could be more empowering. If I were to tell you that there's something that's killing 70 to 88 percent of the population, you know, and, and it's coming your way, and we all got, and you're like, well, what is it? What is it? What is it? But you can prevent it. Ah, that's the message you want to hear. So this is, in some senses, a best case scenario. You can opt out of what's going to kill three out of four people um, in this country. Uh, uh, nine out of ten of the people that are, that are the customers of this casino. And only you. This is, a, this is the largest, this is the world's most vexing problem. It's by far the greatest medical problem. But there is no medical solution. Only a lifestyle solution. And so the doctors here in the Choctaw Nation can recommend that you go to the wellness center and you, you, and you, and you get with Chance and his people, um, but there's nothing in their bag that's going to that's gonna make, make, make a, 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 that, that will be a fix. It will be symptomatic treatment. And it's, it's ineffective, it's costly, and it's, it's putting a, it's putting a Band-Aid on a broken bone. It's not, it's not, it's not good enough. If you have any questions, We need to make sugar public enemy number one. And, I, and you know what? I wish I could stand up here and tell you there's another way, because I'd do it, you know? Maybe we'd come back to the sugar later. Right? We can't. You've got you to get it out. You've got to get it out of your diet. There are people, you got, anyone interested in the games athletes here? All right. Um, there are people that tell me that the games athletes need more carbohydrate than other athletes. I don't know that to be true. Um, in fact, uh, to say that, suspecting that it may not be. But more importantly, I don't care if it is or isn't, because here's the deal. Pushing carbohydrate through your system to burn it off for athletic performance does not mitigate the damage of the sugar. The sugar's damage is intracellular and extracellular, that is inside and outside the cell. Just being there and being burned does the damage. And so if you make yourself skinny and you make yourself fit, 
seemingly fit, and you do that with a high carbohydrate load, the oxidation, the inflammation, and the uh, glycation, that is the sugar covalently bonding permanently to essential protein structures, that process is all underway. And so for those that are, you know, like, well, I'm an athlete, so I need a lot more. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fighting chronic disease. I'm going to the game, so I need a bunch of carbs. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to end up fit and, and extremely sick. And we see it, and we see it regularly. Um, we have several really good examples within our own community and support network. Two of our very best friends in this business that know exactly what's wrong, Tim Noakes and Sami Inkinen, one very, very young, one a senior and accomplished researcher and scientist and Hall of Fame marathoner, both developed type 2 diabetes. Eating perfectly, exercising inordinately, both were shocked at their diabetes. One was diagnosed as a diabetic the same year that he won the world championships of the professional triathlon series. Yeah, how's that? Isn't that amazing? Here was his line. He goes, I couldn't be any fitter. I couldn't eat less. I couldn't do more exercise. How can this be? He had a PhD in physics, so he took a month off of everything and tried to figure out what was wrong with him. He figured it out immediately. It was carbohydrate. His paradigm was flawed. And he was fueling his triathlons with giant boluses of carbohydrate. And through oxidation, glycation, and inflammation, he developed type 2 diabetes. He was going to be a very dead uh, champion triathlete. Question. Great, great question. Um, I'm not sure what natural sugars are. Oh, yeah, there, um, fructose. Um, fructose is the worst sugar, but fruit isn't the worst food. Fruit juice, maybe. The thing about fructose is I don't get a whole bunch of it in an apple. I get all I need for a meal, for sure, but I don't get, a, I don't get an amount that makes me just, oh, that's horrible. But I will in a glass of orange juice, and I will in a Coca-Cola. So sucrose, which is table sugar, is a disaccharide of glucose bound to fructose. Because it's bound to fructose, it's a problem. The glucose is less a problem, but a problem. And in high fructose corn syrup, I have even more, I even have more sugar. So in my, in my, my, the monsters in the sugar world, fructose is number one. That, that makes that an outstanding question. And so, yeah, one of the natural sugars is the worst, okay? Um, galactose, the milk sugar, has a high glycation uh, propensity. But I don't, I don't believe that people are glycating with dairy. I don't, I don't think that's happening. That's a, it's a good question. But I'll, I'll make it easy for you. If it tastes sweet, <clears throat> it's a problem. What about sugar I love them, of course. And what do I love most about them? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, do I believe that ketogenic, ketogenic diets play uh, a vital role in, in a, uh, potentially in cancer treatment? Uh-huh. Yeah, do I think ketogenic diets will uh, stop uh, juvenile epilepsy? Yeah, I do. Better. The brain will take ketones preferentially over glucose. Yeah. I can give you a dose of insulin after you've fasted for 10 days that would kill anyone in this room, and you won't even feel it because it, your blood sugar, low as it is, even slammed to levels that would be fatal for anyone in this room, won't affect you because you're already running on ketones. Yeah. I can't overdose you with insulin if you haven't eaten in seven days. I cannot. Isn't that amazing? Because you don't need glucose after you haven't eaten for seven days. Yeah, ketones are magical. There are, there are researchers that believe, and this is maybe not before everyone here, but young thing asked a question, it's good. We've got we to take a moment here. Um, this is the future, right? Because she's going to be delivering this lecture when I'm gone. Um, there, are, there are researchers that look at my, the mitochondria folks that are really concerned about the mitochondria and how it functions. They believe that the, the mitochondria luxuriates, repairs, rebuilds, fixes structures, 
uh, removes um, pieces that are oxidated. They just, it goes, the, the repair process starts, and it only happens in the presence of ke ketones in the absence of glucose. And it's led these people to believe that that is the natural state, that you were meant to live in the ketogenic environment, milieu, and that you were meant to tolerate the occasional foray into the glucose-rich environment. I think that makes perfect sense. It would be hard for me to take anyone in this room and put you in a natural environment anywhere and you'd find all kinds of sugar. It's just, you know, it's just not what's out there. So yeah, you, you, you've nailed me. I'm a big fan of ketogenic diets. And look at, uh, look at uh, 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 Walter Longo, L-O-N-G-O, and look at the YouTube stuff on him. And uh, look at Dominic D'Agostino, two of them, if you're interested in ketogenic things. I think you've found some interesting ketones, huh? <laughs> yeah, how'd that happen? That's, I've never heard that before and I'm not surprised. Thank you for sharing, that's a, a beautiful thing for you to share that with us. I, I, I would have said this if I thought that's where we were going. I don't think there's a neurological order that, uh, disorder that, that won't respond favorably to a ketogenic diet. I don't think there's a one. Whether it's MS, uh, you know. Anyway. Thank you for sharing. Um, first of all, thanks for coming down and sharing all your knowledge. Um, staying on the keto topic, what are your thoughts with uh, carbohydrates to fiber and the new marketing scheme with net carbs. Well, you know, I, I get the net carbs. We want to separate the soluble from the insoluble, right? You know, I mean, that makes sense to me. Um, what was the rest of the question? Um, so just staying with the ketogenic diet um, and counting the carbohydrates, do you believe in net carbs when counting your carbohydrates? Or you know, now I, make it, I make it even easier for everyone. And I, I'd do this. I'd put fat in the, in the numerator, and I definitely want, I want to drive it up. So I'm going to take more fat in the diet. I'm telling you, you need more fat in your diet. But I want to simultaneously reduce my carbohydrate intake, okay? And, and notice there's no amounts listed here. I'm not telling you. I'm just telling you, you find some way to measure, find some way to assess, and periodically drive the fat up and the carbohydrate down until one of several things happen. And they'll actually, and I'm giving you three because I don't care which one you pick because they really will do something the same. I want an A1C less than or equal to five, okay? And that what that does is it's a measure of glycated hemoglobin. It tells me what your average of blood sugar has been. You only get an A1C less than five if you consume basically no refined carbohydrate. Um, I want to see the ratio of your uh, 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 triglycerides to... HDL, I want to see that less than or equal to one. What I'd ideally like is your triglycerides to fall off the scale to undetectable levels where the test is no longer valid. And depending on the test and the method, I dock what is that, 23, 35, 40 in there. It's a, there's a point where the test is no longer reliable at that, at that low. So you, you, you dismiss the number it's so low. I want a number so low it's dismissed. HDLs, um, less malleable, there's less that we can do to, to adjust them, but high intensity exercise will elevate them. But the really thing you have control here is the numerator. So I want the triglycerides, the HDL less than one. And there's a researcher bar named Barry Sears that has been measuring the ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA, and he wants that less than or equal to one. And these are two uh, 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 fatty acids that control the eicosanoids and prostaglandins that govern inflammatory process. That's a lot. But one of the things we're really concerned about is inflammation. And we're concerned about inflammation because it is part of what happens when these things go south on us, is inflammation. Glycation's another part, oxidative stress is another. This measure of, 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 of uh, inflammation is only gonna be less than one if if your blood lipids are in perfect order and, and your blood sugar is in perfect order and all of that. In fact, so what I'm telling you, you just play with this until you get one of these, and I don't care which one because you're not going to have this good and these bad, this good and these bad, this good and these bad. It won't happen. And so it, this gives you some options here. Um, this fits with the zone. It works with paleo. It works with macros. It works with net carbs. It works with, I don't understand any of this, but I know the difference between a fat and a carbohydrate, and I know what it's like to eat more bacon and less toast. So I can, I can increase my fat intake. And someone says, what about protein? I'd hold it constant. 
Now, everyone's like, oh, this isn't helping. We, we can make it simpler and simpler and simpler. The problem with a one plan fits all is not that the one plan won't fit everyone physiologically, but it won't fit you psychologically or temperamentally. And so someone's asking me, what's wrong with the zone today? Well, one of the problems with the zone is that I have to be able to teach you that if a quarter cup is a block and you need three blocks, then you need three times one quarter cups. And I've had people go, how many is three one quarters? <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. Because <laughs> I have to then say it would be three quarters. <laughs> three one quarters is three one quarters is three quarters. And they're like, hmm. And I'm like, oh, well, let's do paleo. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that is funny, isn't it? So I, so I you know, um, one size will fit all physiologically, but maybe not temperamentally or, or, or intellectually. But I, I don't care either. I don't care. What I want is health. And, you know, like I wanted my dad to do the zone. He wouldn't do the zone. He wasn't going to do the zone. And I was like, well, why? He was like, just not going to do it. You know, it's like, it's why. And so he, uh, he uh, blew a crappy A1C in a doctor's visit. And he's like, dude, you're pre-diabetic. And I'm like, ah, I told you, told you. So he's going to lower his A1C, but he's not going to do anything I want. So the first thing he does is portion control. I've never gone there. I don't talk about portion control. But I'll tell you why. If you cut the high glycemic carbohydrates out of your diet, the portion control will happen. All irrational food choices are around high glycemic carbs. Anyone here like steak? I know you do, huh? <laughs> yeah. But and as much as you love it, I bet you've never finished a steak and then gone and cooked another one, and you get in the car and you go back to the store and get another steak, right? No. Anyone can have three eggs and three more, and I ate the whole dozen. I feel like a turd. I'm going to get another dozen and eat them. And you just you don't do that. But how about with pretzels or candy or sugar-free Entenmann's, right? Fat-free Entenmann's, sorry. You, you remember the Entenmann's? You, know I mean? you ever had a little slice of that and watch a little TV and then go back and have a little slice and go back and watch a little slice and it's, it's gone and it's, that, the Entenmann's is toast. All irrational food choices around high glycemic carbohydrate. People do not do seriously stupid things with fats and proteins. And so my old man, he takes the portion control, so he reduces his portions. But he can't get his, he can't get his A1C below like six and a quarter. So he's okay, well, I'm still not going to do the zone. I'm not going to do paleo. I'm not going to do anything my son would recommend. Um, so what I'm going to do next, see how we are? So what he does next is he removes the added sugar. And I'm like, all right, and I'm watching his plate, and he's, it's, it's turning into what I want on his plate, but he's doing it his way. Good on him. He got his A1C at like five and a quarter. Congratulations, Dad, and you didn't listen to me, okay? I'm not, I'm not that invested in how you do it. This is the most general of notions. Learn the difference between a protein, a carb, and a fat. Fix your protein somewhere around... 21 to 28 if you're a big dude, 35 grams per meal, or don't even remember any of that. I'm, this is for the people that have to have numbers. But take the fat up and the carb done until one of these things just hits that sweet spot. And all along the way, you should get leaner and leaner, feel better and better, have more and more energy, sleep better. Nothing else should be going bad at the same time. The neat thing about finding that sweet spot physiologically is that we don't get side effect. See, with, with medical treatment so often, like, uh, well, I, I, you know, I, we brought your cholesterol down, but you might, your stroke might have been because of the weakening of the vessel wall. Sorry about the side effect, my bad. Um, you don't have that when you find that sweet spot where, where, where an organism should work. So, so rather than side effect, the specter of, of, of side effect is eliminated, and what we see all of a sudden is a side benefit. And what's a side benefit? It's when the, when the client comes and tells me, hey, I came here and told you it was for weight loss, but and I've had this happen, I had Crohn's colitis and now I do not. I didn't want to tell you because I was embarrassed, but you know, I've seen that with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lupus uh, erythematosus. My introduction to the, to the uh, autoimmune disorders was uh, clients come up and telling me that they no longer had them. Yeah, I just remember someone told me, I, 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 I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I was like, what's that? I thought it was like a motorcycle or something. And <laughs> And it was, no, she was a horrible debilitating thing. Oh, good, I'm glad it's gone, you know? She says, well, how'd that happen? I go, no, she says, well, you did it. And I'm like, oh, th thank you, you know? And then I saw another one, and then another one, and then another one. Question. 
Sure. Um, we recommend a diet of meat and vegetables, nuts and seed, um, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. I'm going to do that again. Meat and vegetables, vegetarian. Meat, ah, okay, but vegetables, nuts, seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. You can do it. It's the meat part, right? If you're a vegetarian or a vegan, when I say meat, I want you to hear tofu, tempeh, spirulina, natto, uh, 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 fractionated isolates, and uh, protein powders. One of those. I need a non-fibrous vegetable protein. And, and the key is that the fibrosity of the protein will determine its absorptive rate and, and what the, whether there's a glucagon response. So if, I, if I'm trying to, say, mix uh, 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 grains with legumes to get the full complement of amino acids, and I got, I got beans and rice, so I'm getting all the protein I need, you're getting all the amino acids you need, but it's a fibrous enough protein in conjugate when I, when I dissociate those amino acids. Um, it, it, there's, enough, there's enough fibrosity that the, that the impact is blunted in terms of the glucagon response, and I, and I end up with still an insulin-rich environment. So vegetarians that aren't getting one of those non-fibrous proteins at every meal run the risk of hyperinsulinism and chronic disease. That being said, if you can give me tofu, tempeh, natto, seitan, uh, fractionated isolates, or protein powder at every meal, and for someone your size or somewhere in the neighborhood of... Uh, of 28 to 35 grams per meal, you will be perfectly healthy. That's my experience, that's my belief. Okay. Um, I can use this uh, diet to accommodate just about any food allergy. Uh, 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 my friend Shaka is a, is a Jain. Um, they, by religious conviction, don't eat meat. That's okay, that's good. Kosher, any ethnicity, you know. Um, I. It, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, we're not telling you what to eat, but how to eat, you know? Well, that's a great question. I appreciate it. Are you vegetarian? Uh, I'm a vegan. Yeah, yeah. What's your food? Tofu, tempeh, um, you know. To tofu, tempeh, spirulina, natto. There we go. Tofu, tempeh, spirulina, natto, fractionated isolates. You want me to write those down? I'm going to do it. We got for the one guy. We're going to save a life right now. No, it's a, it's a good question. And if anyone who says, hey, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it like this, and I'm going to do it like that, it's good. So, tofu, tempeh, natto. Those are soy products. Spirulina, blue-green algae. Um, what we call fractionated isolates. That's factory-made protein assembly, like the Morning Star fake meats and that kind of stuff, it's good stuff, and protein powders. The powder, the powderization, the powdering of the, of the protein destroys the fibrosity. So I get a rapid absorption and a glucagon response. Those are my six and I don't have any other, I wish I did, I wish I could, I wish I could give you more. Yeah, but that, that'll help and we've worked miracles with that in Santa Cruz. I stepped into the nutrition world in a vegan rich community and uh, became a star. It was great. It was great. Um, when I meet vegetarians, I don't, I don't try and talk about a vegetarianism. What I do is talk, talk them into sound nutrition and, then, and then, then it'll be their decision to continue or not. But the first thing I want them to do is experience a, a, a true, true health. Anything else? No, and if you're going to tell me, look, dude, I sit on the couch, I eat like that, my numbers are good, and you ask me, am I going to die? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> you know, I mean, I... I um, that's, that's the primary reason. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. Um, I do not know of an adaptation from good nutrition, and I do not know of an adaptation from exercise that doesn't belong to the other camp. And I had forever the experience of exercising people and recommending nutrition, and that gave me a perfect view to see what happened when someone would exercise and eat right and exercise and not eat right. But what I'd never done was recommended a meal plan and not exercise anyone. I'd never done that in 35 years of training. In 1995, I traveled around with Barry Sears administering the zone diet, 
And for the first time in my career, I was putting people on a nutrition plan that weren't, that they were not exercising. I was not making exercising recommendation. We weren't even talking about that. These were sedentary people who were eating poorly and we got them to eat well and they weren't exercising. Much to my chagrin, it was. It was a hard for thing for me to accept and it really bothered me, but everything that I'd ever seen happen, not to the same degree, but the same manner of thing was happening from nutrition. I was getting increased bone density from changing my eating, increased muscle mass from changing my eating. And so I believe now that these things are in an, an indispensable pairing that provide the same benefit, but through, through, through different mechanisms. And so um, do both, but if you're only gonna do one, eat right. Now, Axel Pfluger, our, our uh, chronic disease physician, um, he was up until just recently, and he's a little bit on the fence now, but he was the big exercise guy. And, and I think that, and we, and we don't have, a, it's not a strong difference of opinion, but he just thought, he thought maybe they would be better to exercise and eat poor than to eat well and not exercise. Um, I think he may be wrong. But, but this factors into it long ahead of being able to determine which is, which is worse. It is so much easier to get people to exercise than it is to eat right. And so it won't ever, in a clinical situation, you won't have that trade-off. Um, you're very likely to have people, I'm coming to the workouts and I'm, I'm gonna give myself an A on the workouts and a B minus or a C on the food. I'm not gonna take up any more of your evening. I wanna tell you, CrossFit's here to stay in the form of that man and staff. I'm not gonna quit back in his play. I really like what's happening here. Um, my interest extends, I told you. My mama's tied to all of y'all. Um, but uh, chronic disease is my thing. And I also believe that the need here, the resources here, the mindset of your leadership, the support of your medical community, the support of your chief, the number of gyms you have and the equipment, that there is nowhere on earth where the problem is worse and the opportunity to address it is better. And so that makes it for a smart person right here in the Choctaw Nation is where you start. And what I plan to do is make a sizable impact here through, through, through chance. And then I wanna package what we've done and I wanna go to other communities where there are less resources, where the problem is just as dire. And there are a lot of them where there are brown people, where there are black people, my, my neighbors and friends, brothers in Hawaii, the Maori that we've talked to in, in New Zealand. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. I want your help, I want your support. If you're skeptical, and why you should be, I'm, I tell you there's no bigger, I sit through, most of what I listen to, I'm just under my breath. You know, I'm like, and there's someone here going, good, you're like me. What I ask is that you suspend belief, support us, do an experiment, prove us wrong. Prove us wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you. So on behalf of the Choctaw Nation, um, got Greg a little medallion with the Choctaw seal and whatnot on it, so I'm going to Grace him with this. And uh, again, appreciate all your help. Thank uh, you. Everything you've done. Thank you. I don't know what to say. Um, anybody want some photo ops or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I'm here for you. Feel free to come up. Uh, I'm not running away. Take a picture, shake a hand, all those things. So everybody, thanks for coming out. Thanks for hearing us out. And uh, travel safe.